Miriam Meets on RTE Radio 1 with Miriam O'Callaghan. My guests this morning are musical soulmates who first met in London in the mid-1980s and for the following five years played music together wherever they went. Mike Scott was born in Edinburgh and is the driving creative force behind the Waterboys. Formed in the early 80s, the band has had some incredibly successful albums, including This Is The Sea and Fisherman's Blues. And in 1991, Mike won an Ivor Novello Songwriting Award for his song The Hole Of The Moon. This year, he has published his memoir, Adventures Of A Waterboy. Mike calls Steve the fellow who fiddles. Steve Wickham was born in Dublin and is a professional musician, a fiddling legend according to NME. As a musician he's worked with U2, Sinead O'Connor, Elvis Costello to name but a few. He's enjoyed a really fruitful musical collaboration with Mike and the Waterboys that lasted until 1990. After some years of not playing together, Steve and Mike have rekindled that musical relationship and joined me together this morning. Hello. Hello. (laughs) Where did you first meet, can you remember? We first met on a telephone, actually. This in, is Steve. Yeah, this yeah. is me. I, uh, I got a call. I was living in Ranelagh in a flat and I heard Mike's Scottish voice coming down the line and said, would I come over to London and play with them in 1985? That's And we met physically then, Mike. A few days later. I'd heard him on a, a Sinead O'Connor demo tape before anyone had ever heard of Sinead. And I thought Sinead sounded pretty good, but what really grabbed my ear was the fiddler behind her. And I'd been looking to put fiddle into the Waterboy sound for a while, and this was the sound I was looking for. It's, whoever this guy was, he, he played a real passion and and a kind of power that that I wanted to hear in the Waterboy sound. So I, I phoned him up and invited him to come and play on a what was the last track to be recorded for This Is a Sea, which was called The Pan Within. And he came over to to London. He turned up at the door of my flat, sort of sparkly eyed ragamuffin, <laughs> and he came it's a in. Lovely description. He's still a sparkly eye dragon muffin, as you can see. And he came in. <laughs> <laughs> he came in and he, he lay down on the floor with his head propped on an elbow and told me his life story. Was it a good life story? It was very entertaining, yeah. I have to say, when I lay down on the floor, there was no chairs in your flat. And that that's was right. one of the reasons I was that's laying right. down on the floor. Yeah, that's very true. Just to, just to set the record straight. Although I do like lying down on floors. Yeah, I always used to sit on the floor. And when yeah. I was writing my songs, I would always be on the floor with my, my books yeah. spread out in front of me, yeah. But did you like each other instantly? Ah, uh, yeah, we did. Oh, I yeah. Did. yeah. I liked him immediately, yeah. Why? Is that kind of musical respect? Or you just liked each other? Well, I liked him as a guy straight away. He was just dead easy easy to be with and then he picked up a guitar and started playing along with me and I knew that there was a musical understanding too well, I'd been looking for fiddle for about six months Miriam and, and I was a, a great fan of Bob Dylan and I loved his Rolling Thunder Review tour that he did in the mid 70s which I heard by the miracle of bootleg records and he had this fiddler called Scarlet Rivera and I loved the, the bohemian gypsified sound of the fiddle behind mm. Dylan's voice and I really wanted that in the Water Boys. and when I heard Steve on this Sinead O'Connor demo tape, I just knew this is the guy, this is the one I've been looking for. And when you do end up, honestly, because I'm not in a band, never have been, you end up playing with someone and finding somebody that you musically gel with that well. I'd ask this mm. to both of you. Is that a very special feeling? It's amazing. It's a, it's a once or twice in a lifetime thing. I've only had a couple of musical relationships that have been as as powerful or as as beautiful as the one I have with Steve. Oh, yeah, well, it's lovely to hear that. But uh, I, I know that when I met Mike and heard him writing songs, he was the, f- the greatest songwriter I'd ever heard at that, ever, really. I'll give you the 10 quid. <laughs> no, it's true. I, I know that sounds, maybe sounds a bit no. funny on the radio, but it was at that particular point, the best. At what stage did you join the Waterboys and leave into an... Uh... Well, I think the minute I met Mike and went and recorded in, in London for Pan Within for the This Is The Sea record, I had already committed my musical future to Mike. I'd been in a two and we just made a record for Island Records and we were a big corporation of a band. There was eight or nine people in the band and when we wrote songs, we wrote them in the most... I love all the people in the two. we wrote them in the most awful way. Somebody would write a chorus and somebody would write a middle eight and somebody else would write this and it was, a, it was songs by committee. Mm-hmm. It was lovely friends and all that but it wasn't heart and soul it wasn't songs from the inside of your core and Mike was singing songs like that and I knew the minute I heard the first song it rang resonated oh yeah I gotta do this this is this was it and I asked Steve to come and guest with the Waterboys in our upcoming tour and in Tuanua very unwisely allowed him to go 
And <laughs> Big that, mistake. That was the end, yeah. The lovely thing for us this morning, for the listeners, you're going to play live. Yeah. And the first one, because I will allow you to go over now and get set up, but stay for a moment. The first one you're going to play for me is Savage Earth Heart. Was this the first one you played together? You wrote this, Mike. I wrote this and it's on the first Waterboys album, made a couple of years before I met Steve. But when he came to my flat that day, uh, the first song we played together, in fact, on two guitars, oddly enough, was Savage Earth Heart. And it, by the way he played it, I knew we were going to be musical brothers. Now, will you both go over there okay. and play that for me? Okay, yeah. I love that. That was so beautiful. Come back over yeah. to the table to me. Was that the first time and the first song you played together? In my flat. In, in <laughs> Not Rotten, lying yeah. on the floor now. Crouching on the floor, <laughs> probably. I love the lyrics. What, what's, what is that song about? It's about seeing the... It's kind of like, like seeing God in all creation or Pan, the God Pan, hmm. uh, as opposed to accepting a, a perhaps a Christian picture of the world and the universe uh, taking an older view that might suggest that everything is alive. How old were you when you wrote that song? 23. So you're quite a serious young man. And a punk rocker. <laughs> Tell me a bit about your background for everyone who doesn't know Mike because you've both got different backgrounds which is really interesting. You grew up, tell me about where you grew up and your family. Well I'm from Edinburgh. I lived there till I was 12. I went to a uh, a fee-paying boys' school in the centre of Edinburgh called George Heriot's. It was a magnificent building built in the 1600s, so it was a fabulous environment to to grow up in, even though I just took it for granted. Mm. And it was in the shadow of Edinburgh Castle, incredibly dramatic topography, yeah. Mm. And then when I was 12, um, my parents had split up when I was eight or nine, and then my mum and I moved to Ayr on the west coast of Scotland. And I was there for my teenage years. It's a smaller town. I went to the local comprehensive, had my first girlfriends and my first bands. Were you a happy teenager? Yeah, I think so, yeah. But I I was really only interested in music. I used to buy all the weekly music papers every week and read them cover to cover. I used to spend all my money on cassettes and albums. And then from about the age of 15, I had my first bands. You were an only child at that stage, weren't you, with your mother? I was an only child, yes. There are a lot of benefits, aren't there, in being an only child? Seriously, because you got, yeah. got your mother's undivided love and attention. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. There are, as I've grown older, I realise that there are, there are things you miss out on. You miss the company of siblings, perhaps the support of siblings. And there were times when I was at school where I could probably have done with an older brother. But there are great benefits to being an only child too, like the one you mentioned. And also the amount of space that I had, the amount of personal space I had at home. I never had to fight for space. And my mum would often be out at work and she often taught in the evenings. So I would have a lot of time on my hands. And I used to uh, play music all the time. I used to play my guitar in front of the mirror and have concerts on my own. Were you ever lonely? No. I didn't know how to be lonely. Are you incredibly close to your mother? Well, we, I don't, wouldn't say incredibly close, but we get on great. Did you miss your dad growing up? Well, it's a funny thing when parents split because kids don't know how to process the fact of that or the emotions mm. of it. And for me, I remember my mum telling me when I was eight years old that your dad is leaving because he wants his own life. And, and I remember not being able to understand... What does that mean? What's his own life? Well, his life is with us. Uh, and a kid just doesn't have the mental apparatus to to decipher that or to understand. Mm. So being unable to process the information, I buried it, which I think a lot of kids do, and just got on with my life. But always underneath there was this thing, well, what's happened to my dad? Where's he gone? Doesn't he love me? And he left without ever taking me aside and explaining. He just was kind of gone. And did you ever meet him before you 
met him eventually. Did you meet him when you were growing up? Do you know, he used to come round to the house to see us maybe once every couple of weeks and then maybe once a month and then once every couple of months and gradually drew away. And then when I was 12, I think, was the last time I saw him, he came round like Christmas, um, probably to bring Christmas presents, and then that was the last we saw of him, the old boy. And was music for you then a bit of an escape? I think not, actually. Fair enough. I, I was mad about music before my dad left, and it would have happened anyway. Where did your music talent come from, your mum or your dad? Well, probably neither of them. My mum's grandfather was the cantor in a church on the Isle of Mull. It was a very poor community, and they couldn't afford an organ, so he would lead the congregation, mm. and he would give them the note. That was his job, so it might have come from him. That's so interesting. <coughs> it came somewhere within your gene yeah, pool. That's so interesting. Definitely. Meanwhile, <coughs> Steve Wickham, yes. you were born in the Rotunda. I was born in the Rotunda, yeah. One of six kids? One of six kids, yeah. Would you like to have been an only child? <laughs> no, I would not have liked to have been an only child. I don't think so. You know, when you were talking there, I just something s- learned something about, you were asking about personal space. You know, when, when you have six kids, Mike is... Um, you're very good with your personal space. You, you like your personal space. And I'm terrible, as you know. I, tr- I come into a room and I put this there and I put that there and I put that there. And I realised, just as we were talking there, what that comes from. If you're in a family of six kids, you're cl- claiming your territory all the time. You don't, you don't actually have the territory. Even now, he walks into the band's dressing room. The jacket goes on one chair. <laughs> the fiddle goes on another. A bag goes on another. And none of the band have anywhere to sit. <laughs> That's from being one of six, I think. My dad was a fitter in the CIE. Uh, my mother good worked. job. Yeah, it was mm. a good job. Yeah, I don't know how he managed to raise six of us, honest to God, but he, he did his best. They did their best. And um, my mother really was a housewife. And then when we grew up a bit, she got a job working in the bank. And he paid for music lessons, though, your dad. He paid for music lessons, yeah, he did. And um, they weren't cheap. I went to the College of Music for about 10 years. I was a slow learner, I have to say. <laughs> so... <laughs> But hey, it worked in the end. And your dad's a fiddler too. My dad plays a little bit of fiddle as well, yeah. He hasn't for years now, but he he did play a bit. So is that why he was interested in music? Both of them were that they wanted you to go to the College of Music and do... Actually, my granny gave me a fiddle when I was three. My my mother's mother gave me a fiddle. She gave three of us. There were three, there were lots about 40 different cousins. She gave three cousins who were at the same age at the same time, three of us, three fiddles. So I believe. So she kind of was a catalyst and then and then my dad played a bit obviously yeah what happened to the other two cousins who got the fiddles <laughs> one of them is a musician and he lives out in boston huey purcell okay. okay and then the other fella is a butcher and he lives down in uh, the midland somewhere does he still play any music he, no he took he gave, gave up the fiddle i think and took up the piano and he loves music but he doesn't doesn't make a living out of it but huey huey makes a living out of it but that was a great thing your grandmother did it was fantastic, yeah. Oh, an idea for I've cursed her every single day since. <laughs> and is it true that you eventually got a very sensible job in the bank, which I you did, packed yeah. in? But I had a band all the time. Even even though I was in the bank, I had a band. I used to book book gigs. I put in the earring at the weekend and take it out on Monday morning. Weekend rock and roller. I was, Mike, yeah. Who liked status quo as well. What was this, the, the catalyst, the final catalyst you're packing in the bank job? You know, it wasn't one thing or another. It was lots of things happening at the same time. Did your parents mind you throwing it? They in? were devastated, absolutely devastated. They, were so, they had me sorted. They didn't have to worry about me. I had a pensionable job forever and I would have, uh, you know, earned bonuses and, and be very, very wealthy now. You know, and I, I would have got away with more skullduggery if I'd have been working in the bank than I'd have got away with being a rock and roll musician. But it's interesting you both had the confidence to do that. Did you, when, did you go to college, Mike? What did you do when you left school? I went to university briefly, Miriam, for one year, but I never did any studying. I was only interested in music and punk rock. So you left? Spent the whole year going to gigs, doing my fanzine, and uh, failed all my exams and left. Yeah. When did you set up your first band? It, well, I was already in bands before I went to university, and... On leaving, I put together my first professional band. Yeah, cool. which was called Another Pretty Face, and we were based in Edinburgh. And we did four or five singles on our own labels. First one got a bit of play from John Peel, which was the wow. most amazing thing to yeah. hear your record coming out on the John Peel show. It was um, that was it? We thought we'd made it. 
And then when and how did the Water Boys come about? Well, another pretty face lasted for about three years and we got a record deal with a small London label called Enzyme and they asked us to move down to London, so we did. This was 1981. And Another Pretty Face was run by myself and my then songwriting partner, who was another Scottish lad called John, John Caldwell. And then we split up. He went back to Edinburgh. And I stayed on in London, and Enzyme kept the record deal with me, as effectively as a solo artist. But I didn't want to be a solo artist, and I wanted to have a band. And I didn't have any band members, but I had this name, The Water Boys. Where did you get the name from? I got it from a Lou Reed song. On Lou Reed's album, Berlin, there is a song called The Kids. And at the end, he's got this line, I am the water boy, in that strange voice that Lou has. And, and in that voice, the word water boy sounded so mysterious. And, and I didn't know what it meant. I know now that it's the guy that brings water to the chain gang or the tennis players, etc. But I didn't know then, and it was just a, a mysterious, wonderful word. So I nicked it from my band, my future band, and started recording. And I eventually put together the first live Water Boys from people who'd played on the recordings with me. Mm. So, But when you set out to, say, write the next song, which you're going to sing for me here, which is Saints and Angels, how long did it take you to write that? And what else, what is this song about? Well, this is a song that, that was written very shortly after Steve and I met. We'd been working together for about three months and I had just come to live in Ireland. Steve invited me for a week's holiday. Uh, eventually I came for six or seven years and we did a recording session in Windmill Lane. We just kind of played live all day in Windmill Lane and this song got made up on the spot. Do you remember that song? Oh, uh, yeah, I do. We played all day, 12 hours, and Mike just kept on playing out these songs and new bits and pieces of songs. And Had you planned to invite him to come and live in Ireland? Uh I remember going over to London, uh, seeing Mike, you know, in this place of uh, music business stuff. Mm. You know, we were making music and playing music, but there was all this other stuff of interviews and uh, record company pressure. stuff and all this stuff. Not only media, mm. but all pressure. He looked he like he needed, I needed a break. some social life. Yeah, was he right? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I had a very dry life in London at that time. It was all work. And and no fun. And had you any idea about what Ireland would be like when you came here? Yeah, well, I had a holiday here with my mum when I was 10 or 11. We, we, I think we had a week in Kinsale and a week in Sligo. And I had this sense of Ireland uh, as a, a magical place, as it appeared to my child's eyes. And then I toured here with it on early Waterboys tours. And I, I, I'd been in Dublin and Galway and really liked it. And I liked Steve and I thought, oh, I really fancy going to stay with him and seeing what we get up to. And when you came here, why did you decide to stay? And can you remember the moment where you thought, actually, I think I'll stay here for six or seven years? I don't remember the moment, but it was very obvious very quickly that why why would I leave? I, I, I made friends quickly. I, I had a wonderful time. There was music everywhere. We would play in pubs and cafes, play on the street. It was brilliant. I loved being in Dublin. Steve would, t- would take me around and, and I remember walking into a cafe and, and he saw a guy he knew and he said to this guy, I hear you're playing chess for money these days. And I thought, I want to live in a place where people say things like that to each other. Did you miss London? No, not at all. None of it? Oh no, not at all, no. And when you eventually did discover Connemara, why yeah. was it so important to you? Why do you love Connemara so much? Well, my grandmother was a Gaelic speaker from the Isle of Mull and she moved to Lowland Scotland when she was a teenager, and that broke the language. They they spoke English from then on, and she didn't pass the language on to my mother and my uncle. Uh, and so I grew up with this awareness that there was this lost heritage. When I went to the west of Ireland, to the Gaeltacht, I found that lost heritage. I, I, I didn't learn to speak Irish, but I, I was thrilled to find that my granny's world was still thriving. And that was part of the lure for me of the west of Ireland. So did you get him to have a good social life when he arrived, Steve? I think old Harbots die hard. Mike was always uh, straight into work when he got here. Anyway, he was straight into making a new plan, getting a new sound, getting a, getting this. And, and I think you did you did make your own friends and Vinnie Kilduff and, and loads of people that you did kind of have. We did have a social life, great social life, but old Harbots die hard. Yeah, always driven, Miriam. 
Still driven? Yeah, still driven, yeah. He loves Connemara, but you both ended up playing lots of sessions in places like Clare with Sharon Shannon. Yeah. There was a whole trad thing you got to enjoy as well, wasn't there? Well, I wasn't a trad musician. We got in, Mike got into trad. We got in, I had a good friend that was a trad musician, still have, Vinnie Kilduff, and he was a great Irish v- uh, whistle player. And he played with me in Into Anua. And Vinnie had a big repertoire of Irish music. And I started getting in, being a fiddle player, I started getting into Irish traditional music. And I played a little bit. And I think Mike had heard really me playing tunes and things like that. And the ears pricked up and said, what's that one? What's that one? What's that one? And I remember we did, I had a, a tune called The Tempany Bit and it, became, it got incorporated into a song called When Will We Be Married and things like that. So there was, it was, the ear was pricking up. And I'd be playing Irish music all the time at the dressing room backstage. blah, And... Mike got into it so much, he said, you got to go out and, and learn more about this. I said, take it seriously. He didn't really say it in those words, but I got the, the sense that you wanted me to take it seriously. Yeah. So I started taking it seriously. And I went down to live with Seamus Begley for a week in, in Dingle. My friend Steve Cooney was down there mm. and he invited me down. Come down to Seamus Begley. And Seamus was the well of the pure drop of Irish music. So I had to go down to Seamus and I went down and fair play to him. He put me up and invited me into his house, made me a part of the family. And I had a week of diving in the deep end of the Atlantic source of Irish music. And from there, I went up to Doolan or might have been the other way around. But I went up to Doolan then where everybody said that it was the heart of Irish music at the time. You know, I must remember I grew up in Dublin playing classical music and going to the College of Music and not really an Irish trap. Mm. My dad played little bits of jazz and somewhere over the rainbow and little bits of pieces like that, three coins and a fountain. So I had to go and, and get to the real thing and I went and met um, Michael Russell, who was in Doolan at the time. Oh, Just the venerable, a, yes. He was like a monk, an old monk that lived in, the, in this little house and he had these perfect honey-dropped tunes that he played himself. Simple, simple, simple tunes that had gone back hundreds of years, come from the Iron Islands and were still there mm. in this last little bastion. And, you know, the year after I left, everything changed in Doolan. It just exploded into a tourist destination. And when I got there, it was just at the end of the turf smoke. And, yeah, so that's what I did. And Mike went up to Spiddle and then I followed him up to Spiddle where there was yet another wellspring of Irish music. So how do people like, say, Sharon Shannon end up playing with the Waterboys? When and how did that come about? Well, Steve had met Sharon in Doolin. Yeah, Sharon came around. Sharon came around to the house one night. We had these. I had these mad sessions for for two weeks that I was there. Uh, and I met Sharon around Galway, because she used to go into Galway and play sessions all the time. And we got invited. The two of us got invited to play with her on a recording for her debut album. This was 1989, and we went down to Kinvara to a place called Winkles Hotel. And Sharon was holed up there with recording gear and all her her trad playmates making music. And we joined in. And I remember sitting between Steve and Sharon, listening to his fiddle and her accordion, making this harmony in stereo around me. And I was very moved by the sound. It sounded like the marriage of rock and trad music. And I wanted to hear it in The Water Boys. So I asked Sharon if she'd come and tour with us. So she joined the Water Boys, played with us for a year. Boys it was very that. exciting. We played mm. music all the time. We would play so much music. We'd play in the van on the way to the next town. We'd play in the hotel. We'd play on the way to the gig. We'd play backstage. We'd break the session to do the gig. And then we'd come off stage and go back into the session. And then we'd play all night. It was wonderful. On the aeroplane, in the, in the waiting area, everywhere. You're going to play Saints and Angels for yep. me? And this is a song you wrote and collaborated on together. Yeah. Play that beautifully together. And the strings on that, they're incredibly moving. Come back over to me. I mean, when I listen to you playing that together and I'm watching you and I can see how close you are, you actually look into each other's eyes and you know what, I'm not saying you're in love with each other, but obviously (laughs) you know what you're each going to do. And then you split up. I know you're back together now, but you do have a bit of a separation. In the 90s, well, 1990, I think. It was in 1990, yeah. We just made 
our Room to Roam album. And um, You were riding high. Yeah, we are doing great on the surface, but I think in the bones of the band, things weren't so good. And there were problems in our sound. And Anto, our sax player, and I wanted to change drummers. And Steve was quite withdrawn at the time. And I didn't want to burden him with this decision. It was a bit of a mistake. Steve's smiling. Yeah. I'll get your version in a minute, yeah. OK? It Go, was a, It was a mistake on my part. I should have involved him because he was the... Really, Anto, Steve and I were the leadership of the band, but we left him out of this decision and we changed drummers. And Steve was very upset about that. And I think it was kind of... That was a, a, a last straw for you at the time. And he left. And it was a funny thing because it was the first time in the Waterboys career that we'd had a whole... Irish, British, European, American world tour, totally organised at the right time for the album to be released. Everything was in place. And then suddenly he was gone and the band imploded. We still did the tour with a kind of a, a rump version of the band. It was tough. Steve, you sit there with your head in your hands. Well, uh, you know, it, it was a big blow for Mike and for the Water Boys at the time, I suppose, because not only just me leaving, but the, the, the other people left as well. Sharon came and Colin left and Mike had to reorganise everything very quickly. So, uh, you know, hindsight's a great thing when you look back on it after 20 years and you can think, oh, yeah, I could have done this or I could have done that. But when you're a young man at age 29 and, and uh, you, you're looking out your own set of eyes and you're looking at the future and here listening to your own inner instincts... You know, you have to go with them at the time. And I had a terrible thing for the Waterboys. But in fact, it turned out to be a great thing for me. And I think ultimately f- for for both of us in a way, it was kind of liberating from something. Well, yeah. I know for me it was hugely liberating because I, I actually settled, settled down and started, started family and I did things that really enriched my lives. And I, I discovered more mu- about music as well. Is Mike's version of what happened, I suppose, the firing of the drummer the last straw for you? I mean, from your perspective, it, it was, what happened and as, why did you leave? But as Mike said, it was quite withdrawn at the time. I was, I had just... Why gone, were you withdrawn? I had just gone through a divorce with a, with my wife, my American wife, and um, I kind of resented the water boys a bit for it because I thought, uh, you know, it's taken me away from home. It was wrong to resent the water boys because, in fact, we got divorced for a lot of other reasons. But it, at, when you're 29, you're looking at it, you're thinking, oh, my life is shit. It was, it was the water boys. So it was that and this other thing that Mike said, he hit the nail on the head. I went into rehearsal studio one day and I, I came in as, as Noel Bridgman was walking out. Was he the drummer? He was the drummer. Yeah. I, I, I suppose part of me thought, thought, that could be me. When you said you were going, did you feel anger or did you feel sadness at the time? I was sad, I think, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I was sad that I'd come to that. You were very past. gentlemanly about it. Was I? There was, no, there was no bad vibe or anything. No. And we still stayed friends. There was never any break in our friendship. But were you shocked when he left? Well, do you know, I wasn't because he'd been withdrawn for about a year or so. And he was a bit like, he was one of, the, like one of these characters in a cartoon who's got a black cloud following him around. <laughs> And I suppose I wasn't that surprised, really. But you said later, which we'll get to, that when you went to find him, it was like you were an amputee, that when you oh, lost Oh, yeah, it was terrible Steve. not having him in the band. It was terrible. It was like trying to fly in one wing. Oh, it was awful. It was awful. He'd been so great in the band, and he, he was like my other half, really. So working without him was like a bad dream. But you continue to be successful with the Water Boys. Yep. And you didn't, Steve, for a while. Sorry to be harsh here. It's but all right. No, <laughs> it's, all, it's all right. I had, to, I had to kind of, I had a lot of lessons to learn at the time. Uh, you know, it was a hard time for you, really, wasn't it, when you left? Well, it was, uh, career-wise, it was dreadful because I'd actually, if, if you think about a career, uh, you know, I'd left Mike high and dry and the Water Boys high and dry and to a certain extent. I mean, you know, Mike, Mike could do the Water Boys whether I was around or not. He'd sing his songs whether I was around or not. And, They'd be great whether I'm around or not, really. And I'd done the same thing to a to new when I'd left to, 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 to join the Water Boys. But Island you're a Dragon. nice guy. You just I, have a habit of doing this, Steve. I, uh, I sound like a nice guy, really. <laughs> <laughs> He's a heartbreaker. But hey, great love stories we begin. So how did that get, how did you get back together? Well, we'd always stayed friends, even when we weren't working together. And 
I did a gig in Galway, a one-man show. It's in 1998, and Steve came up and guested with me, uh, and he was sounding pretty good on the fiddle, and I was thinking, God, maybe it's about time we started working together. And I had this loose plan that that I would invite him to, to join me at some stage, but he, in fact, he got to me first. He called me up. He was living in Sligo, and he called me up. I was in London, and he said, shall I put a band together for you? Come out to Sligo and do a gig. And I thought, and I said to him, well, no, let's not do a band, but let's do a two-man gig. And so we did. Yeah, we came, we came out to the Hawkswell. The Hawkswell yes. Theatre, yeah. We did a two-man gig. Yeah. Did you have a row before you went on air? We did have a row, we yes. Did have a row. Not, not, we not, had a row. We yeah. had a row a few days before. Okay, tell me about the row. <laughs> well, I went over from London to rehearse with Steve. And we rehearsed in his house. He has this wonderful house in the shadow of a hill in County Sligo called Harebell House. Yeah. And we're in there rehearsing. And Steve kept getting up. He kept breaking the rehearsal and going off into town on some business that I could never quite I'll get your version, out. don't worry. And I got so fed up with him keeping on going away. And eventually I snapped and I said, look, if you don't, knuckle down and rehearse properly. We're going to be rubbish on stage in a few days. And I've come all this way from London to work with you. And you keep fecking off to Sligo to see a man about a dog. And I want to rehearse properly. OK, Steve, what is your memory of the row? Well, it was a good row. We had a great row. <laughs> I remember we were rehearsing. But you know, you know, when you have three kids, God love you, when you have three kids and you're running out and picking up this and that and the other, and, uh, you know, I was at home and... Uh, also, you said something to me that really got <laughs> got under my skin. Have you not? Do you not realise how important this is? That we're, you know, that. Uh, and I was just thinking to myself, yeah, I, I do know, I do know, I'm doing my, I'm really doing my best here. But you know, I have a life outside the water, boys, and it's not all about that. That's what I was thinking inside. And we were kind of exploded at each other. This was the most important thing. And then we gave each other a big hug. Maybe you needed out. that row almost to clear the air. Yeah, I think so. Mm. Yeah, you see, for me, it was it was like a replay of what had happened before. I was thinking, if he doesn't work hard here... But are you a bit of a control freak? Nah. Oh, is no. he? No. No. Are you Perfectionist. A, a perfectionist. No, I, well, I like it to be good. OK. And I knew that we were on the line. We are going to go out there on stage at the Hawkswell Theatre, the two of us. We haven't played proper gig on stage for nine years. We had to be good we were good. We were good, yeah, because <laughs> because we knuckled down and rehearsed hard. So who's the boss? Who's the, the music more... is the boss, Miriam. Is it? Okay. I think so. I hope so. Our Mike is the boss. He seems a more dominant person, but obviously, Steve, you just keep walking out, so you've got I'm your passive. own way of being dominant. <laughs> I'm passive. The threat is always Passive there. aggressive. Passive aggressive. There was another issue when we fell out. I had said to Steve that he wouldn't sing any songs at the gig. I said to him, I was terrible. That was said, a good idea. I said, no, that was one of your better ideas. I said, people don't come to hear me play fiddle and you sing. <laughs> oh, <that's right>. <laughs> <laughs> he was very pissed off about that at the time, at least in my, my recollection. No, you're probably right. I was, I was been <clears throat> singing with my own band, the Connacht Rambles, yeah. and I thought I was a great singer, of course, at the time. Well, of course, the accommodation that we came to was that he knuckled down and rehearsed hard, and I mellowed about the fact of him singing in the show. And I think we did a couple of your songs we in the show and it, did, he was yeah. really good as well. So it really worked out nicely. We both shifted. Because it could have been a bit insensitive for you to suggest that he's no good as a singer. He's a better <laughs> singer than I am a fiddler. Okay. That's a happy outcome. Yeah. 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 You, of course, record a lot of Yates. You did the Inish Free, which we're going to have now yeah. from both of you. Tell me about how that came about. Oh, well, I I liked Yeats's poetry when I was in my twenties, and and I realised when I looked at it, the poetry book that a lot of them looked like song lyrics. They 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 rhymed and they scanned, and I thought, gosh, why hasn't somebody set these to music? Uh, of course, uh, some people had set them to music, but I just didn't know about it. Uh, the first one we did was the Stolen Child, so on the Fisherman Blues album. And then over the years, I kept returning to the Yeats Poetry Book. And the one you're going to do for us now is like Out of Inish Free. Yeah. It is, yes, okay. which we've transformed from its chocolate box setting into a Delta Blues. I look forward to it. Mike Scott and Steve Wickham, the Water Boys, with Yeats' is The Lake Isle of Inish Free. <laughs> Go to Inish Free 
nine bean rows will I have there And a hive for the honeybee And a small cabin Of clay and wattles made And I will live alone I love that. Lots of people have reasons why they love Yeats's poetry. Why do you love it? I like the things he writes about. I like what he says about them. I like his, I like his perspective. I like what he does with language too. He's a beautiful sculptor of language. His vowel sounds and the yeah. It's always even when he writes weightily. There's always an elegance to the the lyricism. Is it good to be back together playing? It's wonderful. For me, anyway. It's, it's great for me as well. And we're used to it now because we reunited in... Well, that gig in Sligo was 99 and then yeah. he rejoined the band in 2001. Well, I've been back with the Waterboys longer than I was with the Waterboys in the first half. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And in a sense, because you're older, I'm not saying you're wiser, both of you, but you're older, do you enjoy yourselves even more on stage? Like when you go out in July and play the Ivy Gardens, I think it's July the 20th, it isn't is, it? It is, yeah. Would you enjoy yourselves? Oh, we will for sure, yeah. As yeah. much or less than before? More, more, I think more, more yeah. yeah. Why? Um, you can kind of take it all in, I think, as you get older. You can sit and enjoy the experience and relish every moment more than than uh, when you're a greenhorn. You're learning things. You're learning all the time. You're learning all the time, but you get to kind of mother load of learning and you can sit back and then enjoy the experience of whatever it is. Mad. It's mad standing in front of 10, 20, 20,000 people and playing for them. It's just a mad a place to be, I think. For you, Mike, do you enjoy it as much? Uh, more, I think, Miriam. When I was in my 20s, I didn't have the skills to separate the pressures that I was under, perhaps business pressures, from being on stage. The the two would spill into each other. But now, when I walk on stage, there's nothing else in the world impinges on that. I've, I've got my boundaries sorted out and I can just go on stage and and be completely absorbed in the music and the performance and the audience and the experience. And we're going to end on a piece of music, well, a song that's synonymous, really, with the Waterboys, which is Fisherman's Blues. Yep. Did you both write this together? We did, yes. Do you know, it was written the same day as Saints and Angels in Windmill Lane. That was a busy day. It was a fantastic day. We recorded 12 songs that day. Uh, And I had the lyric of Fisherman's Blues on an envelope in my pocket and I brought it out and I started strumming the chords and then Steve put this hook to it and the song emerged out of those two components. But that's amazing because you often hear about people, you know, they agonise over writing a song oh, maybe I do that over too. months. Oh, do you? Oh, years, yeah, that so happens too. Okay, so you don't normally write them in about an hour. Well, they're little t- gifts from heaven, I think. And they happen quite a lot too. Sometimes they're really quick and easy but sometimes they take years. Fisherman's Blues, what's that about? Oh, I had lots of travails at the time and just thought I wish I was a fisherman living what I romantically imagined would be a simple life on the waves of the sea. But you're happy romantically now, aren't you, since you bring it up? I am, yes, thank you. Can I say that you're going... I interviewed her recently, the beautiful Camille O'Sullivan. Yes, you can. And you are an item. We are, yes. Yeah, well, lucky you. Thank you. She's a wonderful woman. And you are very happy too. I'm very happily married to Heidi. We've been married, um, I think, 17 years this year. And, yeah, we rub along together nicely. (laughs) He's laughing. That's a lovely phrase. It's good, actually. But look, I've been delighted to have you both here you. this morning. You. you go over there and get ready and I'm just going to list out some of the events you're doing in the next few months. First of all, my thanks and sound today to Noel Roberts, to my producer Eileen Heron. The Waterboys, that's Mike and a lineup that includes you, of course, Steve, are playing the Ivy Gardens here in Dublin on July the 20th. That's a Friday. Tickets from usual outlets. Adventures of a Waterboy has just been published by Lily Pup Press, which is, of course, Mike, your book, and you'll be reading at the Kilkenny Arts Festival. And Steve, you're performing at the Yates Summer School on August the 6th. That's a trad extravaganza in the Hawkswell Theatre in Sligo. Thank you all very much for listening. We'll be here at the same time next Sunday. Until then, we're going out listening to the Water Boys with Fisherman's Blues. Thank you. Thank you. OK.
Miriam Meets on RTE Radio 1 with Miriam O'Callaghan. Muffin. <laughs> and he came it's a in. lovely description. He's still a sparkly eye dragon muffin, as you can see. And he came in. <laughs> <laughs> he came in and he, he lay down on the floor with his head propped on an elbow and told me his life story. Was it a good life story? It was very entertaining, yeah. <laughs> I have to say, when I lay down on the floor, there was no chairs in your flat. And that That's was one right. of the reasons I was That's laying right. down on the floor. <laughs> yeah. That's very true. Just to, just to set the record straight. <laughs> Although I do like lying down on floors. Yeah, I always used to sit on the floor and when yeah. I was writing my songs, I would always be on the floor with my, my books yeah. spread out in front of me, yeah. But did you like each other instantly? Ah, yeah, we did. Oh, I yeah. Did, did. yeah. I liked him immediately, yeah. Why? Is that kind of musical respect or you just liked each other? Well, I liked him as a guy straight away. He was just dead easy to be with. And then he picked up a guitar and started playing along with me and I knew that there was a musical understanding too. Wow. I'd been looking for a fiddle for about six months, Miriam, and, and I was a, a great fan of Bob Dylan, and I loved his Rolling Thunder Review tour that he did in the mid-'70s, which I heard by the miracle of bootleg records. And he had this fiddler called Scarlet Rivera, and I loved the, the bohemian, gypsified sound of the fiddle behind mm. Dylan's voice, and I really wanted that in The Water Boys. And when I heard Steve on this Sinead O'Connor demo tape, I just knew this is the guy, this is the one I've been looking for. And when you do end up, honestly, because I'm not in a band, never have been, you end up playing with someone and finding somebody that you musically gel with that well. I'd ask this mm. to both of you. Is that a very special feeling? It's amazing. It's a, it's a once or twice in a lifetime thing. I've only had a couple of musical relationships that have been as as powerful or as as beautiful as the one I have with Steve. Oh, yeah, well, it's lovely to hear that. But uh, I, I know that when I met Mike and heard him writing songs, he was the... F- the greatest songwriter I'd ever heard at that, ever, really. I'll give you the ten quid. When you leave. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. I I know that sounds maybe sounds a bit no. funny on the radio, but it was at that particular point the best. Miriam meets on RTE Radio One with Miriam O'Callaghan. My guests this morning are musical soulmates who first met in London in the mid-1980s and for the following five years played music together wherever they went. Mike Scott was born in Edinburgh and is the driving creative force behind the Water Boys. Formed in the early 80s, the band has had some incredibly successful albums, including This Is The Sea and Fisherman's Blues. And in 1991, Mike won an Ivor Novello Songwriting Award for his song The Whole Of The Moon. This year, he has published his memoir, Adventures Of A Water Boy. Mike calls Steve the fellow who fiddles. Steve Wickham was born in Dublin and is a professional musician, a fiddling legend according to NME. As a musician he's worked with U2, Sinead O'Connor, Elvis Costello to name but a few. He's enjoyed a really fruitful musical collaboration with Mike and the Waterboys that lasted until 1990. After some years of not playing together, Steve and Mike have rekindled that musical relationship and joined me together this morning. Hello. Hello. (laughs) Where did you first meet? Can you remember? We first met on a telephone, actually. This in, is Steve. Yeah, this yeah. is me. Uh, uh, I got a call. I was living in Ranelagh in a flat and I heard Mike's Scottish voice come down the line and said, would I come over to London and play with them in 1985? That's And we met physically then, Mike. A few days later. I'd heard him on a, a Sinead O'Connor demo tape before anyone had ever heard of Sinead. And I thought Sinead sounded pretty good, but what really grabbed my ear was the fiddler behind her. And I'd been looking to put fiddle into the Waterboy sound for a while, and this was the sound I was looking for. It's, whoever this guy was, he, he played a real passion and and a kind of power that that I wanted to hear in the Waterboy sound. So I, I phoned him up and invited him to come and play on a, what was the last track to be recorded for This Is a Sea, which was called The Pan Within. And he came over to to London. He turned up at the door of my flat, sort of sparkly eyed rag. I used to buy all the weekly music papers every week and read them cover to cover. I used to spend all my money on cassettes and albums. And then from about the age of 15, I had my first bands. You were an only child at that stage, weren't you, with your mother? I was an only child, yes. There are a lot of benefits, aren't there, in being an only child? Seriously, because you got, got your mother's undivided love and attention. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, there are... As I've grown older, I realise that there are, there are things you miss out on. You miss the company of siblings, perhaps the support of siblings. And there were times when I was at school where I could probably have done with an older brother. 
But there are great benefits to being an only child too, like the one you mentioned. And also the amount of space that I had, the amount of personal space I had at home. I never had to fight for space. And my mum would often be out at work and she often taught in the evenings. So I would have a lot of time on my hands. And I used to uh, play music all the time. I used to play my guitar in front of the mirror and have concerts on my own. Were you ever lonely? No. I didn't know how to be lonely. Are you incredibly close to your mother? Well, we, I don't, wouldn't say incredibly close, but we get on great. Did you miss your dad growing up? Well, it's a funny thing when parents split because kids don't know how to process the fact of that or the emotions mm. of it. And for me, I remember my mum telling me when I was eight years old that your dad is leaving because he wants his own life. And, and I remember not being able to understand... What does that mean? What's his own life? His life is with us. Uh, and a kid just doesn't have the mental apparatus to to decipher that or to understand. Mm. So being unable to process the information, I buried it, which I think a lot of kids do, and just got on with my life. But always underneath there was this thing, well, what's happened to my dad? Where's he gone? Doesn't he love me? And he left without ever taking me aside and explaining. He just was kind of gone. And did you ever... What stage did you join the Waterboys and leave into an... Uh... Well, I think the minute I met Mike and went and recorded in, in London for Pan Within for the This Is The Sea record, I had already committed my musical future to Mike. I'd been in a two and a... We just made a record for Island Records and we were a big corporation of a band. There was eight or nine people in the band. And when we wrote songs, we wrote them in the most... I love all the people in the tour. We wrote them in the most awful way. Somebody would write a chorus and somebody would write a middle eight and somebody else would write this. And it was, a, it was songs by committee. Mm. It was lovely friends and all that, but it wasn't heart and soul. It wasn't songs from the inside of your core. And Mike was singing songs like that. And I knew the minute I heard the first song, it rang, resonated. Oh, yeah, got to do this. This, is, this was it. And I asked Steve to come and guest with the Waterboys in our upcoming tour. And in two Anua very unwisely allowed him to go. And <laughs> Big that, mistake. That was the end, yeah. The lovely thing for us this morning, for the listeners, you're going to play live. Yeah. And the first one, because I will allow you to go over now and get set up, but stay for a moment. The first one you're going to play for me is Savage Earth Heart. Was this the first one you played together? You wrote this, Mike. I wrote this and it's on the first Waterboys album, made a couple of years before I met Steve. But when he came to my flat that day... Uh, the first song we played together, in fact, on two guitars, oddly enough, was Savage Earthheart. And it, by the way he played it, I knew we were going to be musical brothers. Now, will you both go over there okay. and play that for me? Okay, yeah. I love that. That was so beautiful. Come back over yeah. to the table to me. Was that the first time and the first song you played together? In my flat. In, in Not Northern, lying yeah. on the floor now. Crouching on the floor, <laughs> probably. I love the lyrics. What, what's, what is that song about? It's about seeing the... It's kind of like, like seeing God in all creation or Pan, the God Pan, hmm. uh, as opposed to accepting a, a perhaps a Christian picture of the world and the universe uh, taking an older view that might suggest that everything is alive. How old were you when you wrote that song? 23. So you're quite a serious young man. And a punk rocker. <laughs> Tell me a bit about your background for everyone who doesn't know Mike because you've both got different backgrounds which is really interesting. You grew up, tell me about where you grew up and your family. Well I'm from Edinburgh. I lived there till I was 12. I went to a uh, a fee-paying boys' school in the centre of Edinburgh called George Heriot's. It was a magnificent building built in the 1600s, so it was a fabulous environment to, to grow up in, even though I just took it for granted. Mm. And it was in the shadow of Edinburgh Castle, incredibly dramatic Beautiful. topography, yeah. Mm. 
And then when I was 12, um, my parents had split up when I was eight or nine. And then my mum and I moved to Ayr on the west coast of Scotland. And I was there for my teenage years. It's a smaller town. I went to the local comprehensive, had my first girlfriends and my first bands. Were you a happy teenager? Yeah, I think so, yeah. But I, I was really only interested in music. 